Welcome to part 8 of our third Read Repairs video where we're working our way through the repairs to an 18th century three train spring clock. And we're at that stage where we are investigating the main springs. Now this clock has got three main springs, uh, a quarter striking side, a going train, the time, and a quarter striking side. And we're only interested in the quarter striking and the going train because you may remember that when we disassembled this clock, those barrels that contain the springs had gotten mixed up. Um, so we don't know which spring came from which. But what we do know is one spring appears to be quite old, maybe late 19th century, I don't know, which uh, appears to be about the right strength for the clock. And the other spring is a later replacement and just uh, feels too strong. But we don't know that, of course. So this led me to thinking about three questions that we need to ask or that we might want to ask uh, in this situation. And the first of those questions is the obvious one, and it's how do we know how much torque a clock needs to run? The second of our questions is how do we determine how much torque output there is from any given spring, and does it match the answer to question one? And the third question is if we know how much torque a clock needs to run, then how do we choose a spring to fit that requirement? So there are three elements to what we're going to do today. Now, I should say that this is not at all definitive. It's very preliminary investigation of what I think is a really important and under-researched area of clockmaking horology. So if you are part of an institution that might be interested in continuing this research in a more formalised way, then please get in touch. So before we jump into it, as always, remember to like, subscribe, leave your comments below, and don't forget the special thanks button that you can press below as well, uh, which helps enormously. So, uh, here we are. So the first part of this is going to be uh, making a way of driving the clock, a spring-driven clock normally, by calibrated sectional weights. So I can, in a controlled way, adjust the amount of driving force to determine what I feel is the optimal force for either of the trains that we're interested in. So like all the best projects, we start with a bit of plywood and some perspex and I'm essentially making a pulley here uh, around which I can wrap a cord and then hang my weights from that cord. With various operations of uh, bits of plastic and machining and the way I'm going to fit my uh, pulley to the winding arbor of the fusee is via my set of let down keys. So these are keys that you would normally use to uh, let down the mainspring of a clock but they happen to be available in a range of sizes and they're standardized in outside diameter so they fit this project perfectly. So I've got two Perspex discs here. The outer of the two discs 
is purely um, a bracket, if you like, to hold the uh, bearing of the first disc. Obviously this doesn't exactly relate to how the clock would be driven via a spring because we've got this uh, bearing race which will have a very small amount of uh, friction but I think for uh, this project uh, this is absolutely fine, it gets us in the ballpark. So once we've made our um, first part of the uh, torquinator I measured the diameter of the pulley and it's just over 77 millimeters radius. And what this enables us to do is to calculate from the driving weight the force required in Newton meters. And then I can begin to think about what kind of spring is going to relate to that value. So we begin with the striking train. This is the hour striking train. So what we're essentially interested in here is the cadence of the striking or how fast the striking strikes. And so I begin with, I think, about 500 grams at 77 millimeters. And I uh, slowly add weight until I get up to a kilogram at 77 millimeters. And then it's really a case of deciding where you want that value to be and um, for me I would always err on the side of uh, less is more when it comes to driving force because uh, I would prefer to have the striking sounding a little bit sluggish um, with less wear than having it sounding a little bit strident with maybe unnecessary wear but this is all about the principle and um, and hopefully that is communicated in this video. So once we've dealt with the striking side, we can move on to the going train, which in um, many ways is easier because we don't have to make the same judgment call about how fast we want the striking to run. We just want the clock side to run and to release the striking and so on. So we need um, a reasonable safety margin, but I determined that the actual minimum value that the clock will run on is about 0.37 newton meters and as we'll see in a while our older spring is just um, somewhere between 0.4 and 0.5 newton meters so that to me would seem to be a reasonable uh, safety margin if you like the second part of uh, making our talkinator is to test the output values of the springs that we've already got and any new spring that we decide to fit. So I get one of these um, handy sort of digital torque meters which uh, is not a calibrated instrument so I make no claims for it although I think the uh, instructions that come with the instrument tell us that it's got a typical uh, accuracy within 1%. So absolutely fine for the purposes of this uh, little experiment. And I want to, again, fit this uh, torque meter to my letdown keys. So I make a brass adapting piece.
once I've done that, we can measure the torque output of all three trains. You'll see from these uh, graphs that I measured each train for each turn of the fusee, so 16 turns altogether, and I did each one three times, then took a mean average. And for the springs as they were in the clock, remember, we think they were probably mixed up, we can see that the spring that was in the striking train um, was running at an average of 0.46 newton meters and is actually relatively flat so it's reasonably well matched to the fusee. This is what made me decide to move that spring, as I said the barrels were mixed up anyway, to the going train because it's an old spring and it has a, got a nice flat torque output when matched to the fusee which is great for timekeeping and for reducing escapement error. For the striking side that's not quite so important because if there's a bit more of a variation in the cadence of the striking over the course of a week nobody is really going to notice as long as it's not too, um, too crazy. You can see the spring in the quarter striking train is uh, running at an average of about one newton meter. It's a much bigger barrel and it has much more work to do. So that seems perfectly reasonable. But it's a spring in what is our going train that is problematic. Uh, we just saw that the going train uh, needs um, uh, a torque output of about 0.37 newton meters and the spring that's in there is running at an average of about 0.93 newton meters so it's essentially massively overdriven and that is going to cause us all sorts of uh, all sorts of problem with accelerated wear and maybe even catastrophic failure so that modern spring I'm going to replace it with uh, another modern spring it's the only one I can get um, but one that's uh, much less strong. And I'm going to put that in the striking train, which we know could be run at about half a newton meter. And maybe that cadence is a little bit on the slow side, but that is where I would prefer to begin. So in order to um, fit or find a new spring, we just remind ourselves of the relationship between the width and the thickness of a spring and the output. So the strength of a leaf spring, a plain leaf spring, and I acknowledge that these are not quite the same because they're curled round inside of the barrel, but it's a useful place to begin, is proportional to the width. So if you double the width, you double the strength, as we can see here, 2x. The reason I think that people get into a lot of difficulty with mainsprings is a leaf spring, uh, the strength of a leaf spring is proportional to the cube of its thickness. So a little, or what appears to be a little change or difference in thickness makes a massive difference to the change in strength. And um, so what I can do uh, with choosing a new spring is to work with both thickness and width because there isn't that much um, choice available uh, in new made springs and because steel technology is obviously very different from what it was 200 250 years ago we often have to do quite a lot of experimentation so I'm going to fit a narrower spring I couldn't find a weak enough spring for the full width of the barrel but because we don't want the spring to be flopping about inside the barrel obviously I'm going to fit some spacing pieces 
um, allowing the usual about one millimetre or so of uh, sort of end shake within the barrel. So with the spacing pieces in place, we can reassemble the striking train, we can test it with our torque meter, and then we can hear for ourselves what the our striking train uh, sounds like. And I think that is a pretty good result. We've reduced the value of that spring from over 0.9 newton meters down to about half a newton meter. So a significant reduction in the amount of wear that's going to take place on this part of the clock mechanism. And we have a perfectly reasonable functioning um, clock and we've returned the old spring to the uh, going train where it seems to be incredibly well matched. So there we are. I hope you found that of interest. Um, as I said earlier, this is only preliminary work. It's not definitive, um, but you can see it gives us one practical solution for a way forward in determining uh, the torque requirements and the torque outputs of springs for fusee driven clocks. As always, don't forget to like, subscribe and leave your comments below. And if you use the content in any way in your practice, it's always incredibly helpful if you press the special thanks button that you'll find just below this video. So that's all for now and we will see you very soon with the concluding part of this project.